Hola, muy buenas tardes de nuevo. Retomamos la conexión, que ahora contamos con Ben Ternoff. Hello, ben Ternoff es un intelectual eh, norteamericano que ha venido escribiendo sobre la resistencia de los movimientos eh, de trabajadores de las eh, compañías tecnológicas. Es contribuidor del The Guardian, es editor de Logic Magazine, ha contribuido también a Jacobine. Digamos que es una persona que aparte de estar comprometida con el pensamiento y la articulación de crítica al capitalismo digital, ha aportado grandes recursos a la lucha y a la, a la organización obrera. Tenemos la suerte de contar con él hoy y no hago más que darle paso porque a quien queremos escuchar ahora mismo es a él, tratar de aprender y discutir con él. Y luego tendremos oportunidad de hacerle algunas preguntas porque creo que tenemos mucho que aprender de los procesos de resistencia en California, en Estados Unidos y en el mundo. Muchas gracias, Ben. Thanks so much for having me, Ed Katz, and thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizers for, for having me um, participate. Uh, so the, the theme, I think, of, of this portion of the conference is uh, resistance and the future of work. Um, and I'll be talking briefly about a particular kind of work, uh, tech work, uh, the, the work that creates and sustains the digital infrastructures that mediate an increasing uh, portion of our lives. And over the past few years here in the United States, a really unprecedented wave of rank and file mobilization has taken place in the US tech industry among all different levels and layers of the industry. Uh, I myself am a tech worker. Uh, I'm also a writer and an editor of Logic Magazine. And as I've uh, participated in a small way in these mobilizations, I've also been trying to document them and to think about how they fit together, what their mechanics are and what, what they mean uh, politically. So I wrote a long piece, uh, which was published by Logic Magazine earlier this year which is a kind of culmination of my attempt to think through this emerging tech worker movement from the inside as a participant and observer. And in the piece, I wanted to do two main things. The first is to try to tell a story, you know, just record what has the story been of the tech worker movement so far? Where did it come from? What are its principal phases and inflection points? What are its major themes and dynamics? Uh, there's been a lot of good journalism on these mobilizations in the US, but it tends to treat individual actions in isolation. And it's hard to find kind of a global picture of how does it all fit together? So that's what I kind of aspire to do. And I'll share some of that Hopefully it will be of interest to, to some of you who uh, may not have been following the story very closely. So hopefully I'll, I'll be able to give you at least the broad strokes of what we've seen here in the US over the past few years. But the other piece that's really interesting to me is uh, trying to analyze uh, why this phenomenon is taking place. And there's a lot to analyze. I think there are a lot of mechanics that are quite interesting, but the one element that was most, let's say theoretically fascinating to me and one that I had most direct experience of, which was how did a group of full-time office workers at large tech firms like Google who earn relatively high salaries and enjoy relatively good working conditions certainly relative to the immiserated state of most people in US capitalism, how did this relatively privileged layer of workers come to see themselves as workers? That's a process that would, was not self-evident at the outset. They come to see themselves as workers and how they discover and develop this worker identity. As this process develops, they begin to engage in collective action in their workplace. They deploy the techniques and the rhetoric of labor struggle, and they build relationships of solidarity with their working class colleagues in the tech industry. So in other words, what interested me theoretically about this story was how a process of what we could call class formation unfolded among a group of people who couldn't possibly be described as proletarians, 
but who were nonetheless embracing a more proletarian perspective and orientation. So in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes, I'll try to sketch both of those pieces for you as concisely as I can. The story, what is this movement? You know, what are its main moments? And give you a little bit of that analysis of how does this process of class formation unfold? So maybe let's start with, with the story portion. Uh, as I mentioned, my goal was to try to narrate the evolution of this movement as a whole. Um, and the first step was trying to articulate what the different struggles were and how they fit together. And it was a, tr a little bit tricky because this movement, as I mentioned, is taking place among a variety of types of workers, uh, struggles at different companies around different issues. So I started, um, just because this is how my mind works, by coming up with a couple of taxonomies that help organize some of the main aspects of the movement and hopefully help us think about it as a whole. So broadly, tech worker struggles in the United States have fallen into three categories. The first involves what might be called bread and butter issues, wages, benefits, working conditions, kind of traditional issues uh, of, of labor struggle in the United States. The second centers on the demand for safe and equitable workplaces, free from sexism, racism, and other kinds of oppression. And the third kind of struggle has been motivated by concerns about social harms inflicted by particular products, contracts, or technologies. Now, alongside this taxonomy, we could put together another one, which is the types of workers who are taking part in these struggles. Again, I think broadly we see three categories. The first is the full-time office worker directly employed by a tech company. These are the folks at the top of the office hierarchy. They tend to be the best paid. They have the most labor market power. It's what most people think about when they imagine someone who works in tech, right? The Google software engineer being perhaps the archetype. The second category, which is certainly less visible in the mainstream conversation, is the subcontracted office worker. These are folks who are not directly employed by the tech company. They're employed by a contractor who then has a contract with the company. But they perform various white collar functions for that company, sometimes on site, sometimes off site, and they do a lot of different things. So you may have heard about Facebook content moderators who have to endure these, this kind of grueling experience of seeing very violent and traumatizing videos and taking them down. Those folks are a good example of this category, the subcontracted office worker. But if that's at the lower end, you know, a lot of traditionally higher end functions are also increasingly being performed on a subcontracted basis. Software engineers, product design, and so on. The last category to talk about here uh, is the subcontracted service workers. Now, these are folks who are not directly employed by a tech company, um, but instead of performing office work, they perform service work. So Silicon Valley campuses uh, have tons of security guards, janitors, cooks, and other support staff. So if you think about the big firms like Facebook, Google, and so on, if you visit their offices at Silicon Valley, you'll see hundreds and even thousands of these folks working in this, these support roles, because it takes a lot of people, as you can imagine, to make these very large campuses run. Now, I should say, as with any schema, there's a lot this doesn't capture. Um, you may have noticed gig workers are not captured here. Uh, gig workers uh, have been an important source of, of militancy and mobilization in recent years, as have Amazon warehouse workers. So those are two types of workers that I don't actually discuss much in my piece, but are, are certainly worthy of, of close attention because they've, they've also been engaging in uh, labor struggle in recent years. <clears throat> 
So the, the starting point for my story is, is really to make the, the, this basic point, which is the mobilizations among tech workers that we've seen among the highest end of tech workers, like the Google software engineers, to understand that phenomenon, you really have to start with the subcontracted service workers, the folks like janitors, security guards, and shuttle bus drivers who are at the other end of the office hierarchy. In mid 2010s, these workers engaged in a series of successful union struggles that I believe supplied the first spark that set this broader movement in motion. The unionization of people like janitors and security guards in Silicon Valley, it's actually not a new phenomenon. It's been going on since the early 90s. But in the mid 2010s, there were a series of big wins uh, in quick succession. So in only three years, from 2014 to 2017, 5,000 subcontracted service workers in Silicon Valley unionized. That's a lot of people, certainly by US standards where the labor movement is not particularly strong these days. So by unionizing these janitors, security guards, shuttle bus drivers, and so on in Silicon Valley, secured a measure of relief from the punishing math of the Bay Area, because despite working for some of the richest companies in the world, these workers uh, tend to make very low wages. And they also live in one of the most expensive real estate markets in the country. It's very, very expensive to live in Silicon Valley. So by unionizing, you know, they, they managed to get better wages and better benefits and so on. And this is absolutely critical, but they also do something else, something which would be very significant for the development of this broader movement at other layers of the industry, which is that they make a lasting impression on many full-time office workers as a number of the latter mobilize to support these unionization campaigns. So what you see is there's an impressive amount of solidarity work where folks like full-time software engineers are engaging in collaboration with folks like security guards in order to support their unionization effort. And there's a variety of specific uh, strategies that are employed, which we could get into uh, in the questions if it, if it interests, um, but this really has an important effect because as you can imagine, folks like software engineers at these big firms, you know, hold a lot of leverage, a lot of power. And in many cases, uh, they were able to exercise that leverage in solidarity with these unionizing service workers. What kind of effect did these unionization struggles have on the full-time employees who lent their support to them? I'm gonna read you a quote from one such worker from Facebook. Now, again, this is someone in a relatively privileged white collar technical role who helps support the unionization campaigns of subcontracted service workers. This individual says, I used to read venture capitalist Paul Graham and other Silicon Valley thinkers that rail against unions. The cafeteria worker campaign opened my eyes and made me realize that a union is just a group of workers making demands together. Organizing wasn't some abstract thing I read about in the news anymore. Instead, I talked to workers about what better wages and benefits would mean to them and their families, and there was no way I could not want that for them. Now, there are a couple of things going on in this quote that I would call your attention to. One is that the Facebook employee is reevaluating the anti-union ethos that they had absorbed from the thought leaders of the industry and that its chief ideological leaders are continuously promoting on social media and elsewhere. The other is that the employee is receiving a valuable education in the tactics and the techniques of worker organizing. And both of these would be very, very useful for subsequent mobilizations by these white collar workers. But the most radical realization 
facilitated by these encounters across this large class and occupational divide. The most radical realization here would be the simplest, which is the idea that tech's full-time office employees, software engineers, these product designers and so on, were also workers, not professionals, creatives, or entrepreneurs, which is how such workers are, have traditionally self-identified in the tech industry, which is a self-identity sustained by a mix of factors from relatively high salaries uh, to the neoliberal assumptions of the California ideology. Those were being put aside and through these encounters, they were coming to a new identity, a new understanding of their position within the workplace, which is one of workers. So earlier I had mentioned that I was hoping to do two things here, provide a little bit of the story and a little bit of the analysis. And here I'm gonna put the story to the side and get a little bit more into the analysis. Cause I think this quote from this Facebook white collar worker gives us a good entry point. So let's start that analysis with a question. Uh, which is what is the class position of a full-time office worker in tech? Say our, our Facebook uh, worker who we just heard from. If we're approaching this question from the Marxist tradition, we might have trouble thinking about this worker as a proletarian or bourgeois. Rather, they appear to belong somewhere in the middle. And the question of how to think about class positions in the middle is a very vexed and long debated question within the Marxist tradition. Of course, there are many very vexed and long debated questions <laughs> within the Marxist tradition, possibly all questions uh, are that, but, but class in the middle, I think is a particularly tricky one. In, in my work, I've drawn on Marxist sociologist, Eric Olin Wright's theories to help me think through this problem. And Wright famously proposed that certain class positions are neither fully proletarian nor fully bourgeois, but combine elements from both. And he called these contradictory class locations. Because those who inhabit these locations live a contradictory mix of bourgeois and proletarian elements in their class experience, they're continuously pulled in two directions. So they can focus on the bourgeois elements in their experience and identify upwards with the capitalist class, or they can focus on the ways in which they're proletarian and forge alliances downwards with the working class. The experience of full-time office workers within the tech worker movement offers, in my view, a fascinating illustration of the latter phenomenon. Through certain experiences and struggles, the proletarian elements in their contradictory class location were given greater salience. They were amplified and foregrounded. And a really important ingredient in this process particularly for many of those who would go on to play important roles in the white collar mobilizations, was this solidarity work with subcontracted service workers to support their unionization campaigns. That through the relationships forged in this work, full-time office workers found points of contact, let's say, between their experiences and those of subcontracted service workers. Now, obviously, these are very different kinds of workers who face very, very different situations. But beneath the vast and obvious differences, compensation, employment status, working conditions, and so on, there were certain parallels that emerged in their encounter. And these parallels caused the white collar workers to acquire a different understanding of their own class position. It underscored the proletarian elements of their experience, elements that had always been there, but were largely suppressed in their salience 
Now, what are these proletarian elements more concretely? I feel like I've been speaking at a certain level of abstraction and it's useful to try to bring things down to earth a little bit more. I'd argue that the proletarian elements in the contradictory class location of the full-time office worker, it's kind of a mouthful, <laughs> that these proletarian elements uh, take a range of forms, but among the most important are those rooted in race and gender. There's a famous line from the, the British Marxist uh, Stuart Hall about how race is a modality in which class is lived. And I've relied on this line a lot to, to help guide my thinking. And I think it's particularly useful in this case, because I think we can say that in the case of the tech worker movement, race and gender have been modalities through which tech workers of the middle layers live the proletarian elements of their contradictory class location. And this fact may help explain why most leaders of these campaigns have been women and people of color. Women and people of color in these middle layers are more likely to be proletarianized. And we could illustrate that with a number of statistics. They earn lower salaries on average, in addition to facing, of course, a lot of harassment, discrimination, and other forms of oppression in what remain very heavily white and male dominated workspaces. So one of the themes we see in this movement is the centrality of race and gender in shaping and sustaining the class dynamics of this movement. These relations are not counterposed to one another, but deeply integrated. That, that identification with subcontracted service workers is often in happening through relations of race and gender, but is ultimately expressing itself in class terms. What are a few of these other elements that we could say? Well, another classic element, which is a, a, an element of the proletarian condition more broadly is lack of control over production and investment decisions of the firm, right? If you're a worker, one of the things that defines you as a worker, among other factors, is that you are not the one making decisions over what the firm decides to produce or how it's produced. And this is very much the case for these white collar tech workers. Even the ones who may earn a relatively high salary do not have real control of their work or real input into the direction of your company. Now, of course, this has always been the case. But this lack of meaningful input into deciding what technologies were being built and how they were being built began to be perceived more intensely, was felt more acutely as a lack by white collar tech workers in the period after Trump's 2016 election. And this is really the crucial turning point, in my view, the catalyst that helps move collective action from the subcontracted periphery of the industry into the salary core is the election of Donald Trump in 2016. In the aftermath of the election, there are a lot of concerns among white collar tech workers about their leaders' swift accommodation of Trump, that many Silicon Valley leaders during the 2016 election had denounced Trump. Once he had won, they, they appeared to capitulate immediately and signaled their willingness to do business with him. And a number of white collar tech workers were afraid that the industry would be enlisted to build technologies that would help Trump fulfill certain campaign promises like the Muslim registry, which was a 2016 campaign promise to create a database of all Muslims in the United States. So these fears they fuel a new mood of moral urgency, particularly around the capacity of technology to cause harm. And there's a wave of, of activity as white collar tech workers are trying to figure out how they might be able to fight the new administration. And there's 
in this period of uncertain, uh, this period of activity rather, some uncertainty about where to put this energy. Um, a large number of white collar tech workers in the aftermath of the 2016 election were becoming newly active, but they didn't exactly know how to be active, how to take action. This is where uh, an organization called the Tech Workers Coalition becomes really critical. This is an organization that had been founded earlier in 2014 um, and was unique in putting forward a workplace-based collective action approach to making change and emphasizing a class analysis that defined even relatively privileged white collar tech workers as workers. And this analysis, on the one hand, an emphasis on collective action in the workplace, and on the other hand, defining white collar tech workers as workers did two things. First, it helped make sense of people's estrangement that they felt from their leaders after these conciliatory moves towards the new administration. Because it seemed to, to confirm the fundamentals of this basic class analysis that organizations like Tech Workers Coalition were putting forward, that the tech industry, like any industry, was divided into workers and bosses. But the second thing that this analysis provided, even more importantly, is it gave a method for making change. To the extent that tech workers were workers, they could exercise leverage over management the same way workers in other industries did through collective action. So it wasn't just an abstract perceptual shift, right? But it was one that in turn made new types of activity possible. So it opened a, a different horizon for action. Of course, it wasn't enough to just put these ideas into circulation. The consciousness changes through practice and specifically through struggle. It's one thing to tell white collar tech workers, you're a worker. And it's quite another thing for those workers to live the truth of that statement directly, to have it validated by their own experience. And this is what we see increasingly in the post-2016 period in 2017 and, and really in 2018, is that as this new sense of moral urgency around the social harms of technology increases within the context of the Trump administration, white collar tech workers begin trying to mitigate these harms by claiming more control over what their firms we're building. And in response, as you can imagine, they meet stiff resistance from management and discover that they are in significant respects workers. So the idea of the tech worker as an identity becomes more plausible to more people as a new cycle of political struggle triggered by Trump brings, we could call the proletarian elements of this contradictory class location into sharper focus. And one of the lessons here among many, I think, is that collective action is not just an instrument for transforming the workplace and by extension the world, but it also transforms those who engage in it, that people and their ideas are made and remade through struggle. Now, I realize <laughs> having talked to you for, for 20 plus minutes about these, these various things, that it might be helpful to hear about a few of the mobilizations I'm talking about. Uh, and I apologize, I probably should have opened with that. <laughs> I realize that many of them are uh, well known to an American audience because they were covered quite widely in the press, but, but they may not be known quite as well um, internationally. So let me give you a few examples of the types of things that I'm talking about. And collective action among white collar tech workers really reaches escape velocity, really finds its footing in 2018. There are a number of major important breakthroughs in, in 2018. One of the biggest is in the summer of 2018, uh, Google workers succeed in shutting down Project Maven contract. Project Maven is an ongoing algorithmic warfare initiative at the Pentagon. 
basically looks to uh, leverage machine learning for various purposes, including um, improving drone strike targeting. And over a, a year long campaign, workers within Google succeeded in pressuring management um, to ultimately cancel the contract, uh, which was a large victory, I think one not expected even by the organizers of that campaign and one that was covered very widely in the US press and which uh, inspired a lot of similar actions by tech workers in other workplaces. It also presented a conclusive answer to the tactical uncertainty of the post-election period. I mentioned people had all this energy, but they didn't quite have a theory of how to make change. And the victory of the campaign against Project Maven validates the strategy of workplace-based collective action and taking this, this class-based approach. And it inspires a wave of mobilizations elsewhere. Um, there are a number of campaigns known under the banner of Tech Won't Build It against collaborations with ICE, because these various tech firms supply different parts of the digital infrastructure that ICE, uh, one of our immigration services, uh, uses to run its detention and deportation regime. In November 2018, we see the Google walkout, which if you've heard of any of these campaigns, this, this may be the one that you've heard of. It was absolutely massive. It featured 20,000 Google workers in offices around the world staging a walkout to protest sexism, racism, and the abuse of power. Probably the biggest uh, numerically speaking action we've seen so far. 2019 and 2020 bring a number of new developments in particular intensifying struggles by subcontracted office workers, uh, people like Facebook content moderators, Google data analysts, a group of Google data analysts actually managed to unionize in September 2019 in Pittsburgh. And in February 2020, uh, full-time employees at Kickstarter vote to unionize, uh, which is at this point, you know, the first uh, full-time tech workers union in the United States. Where I'd like to end, because we're coming up on um, the half hour mark, is to sketch very briefly what the picture looks like in 2020. And I think it's broadly defined by a rising tide of retaliation from management. This had started before, particularly in 2019, um, you saw management start to crack down, uh, start to push uh, known organizers out of these companies uh, and starting to create an environment of fear. Um, particularly at Google and, and then at Amazon. Uh, I think going forward, it's unclear uh, how effective this retaliation campaign will be and how much further it will go. And the other, you know, the other major factor that of course everyone in the world is dealing with is the pandemic. And I think there's a lot of open questions as well of how the pandemic will affect the organizing landscape. You know, in, in certain respects, it's, it's helped inspire new militancy. Amazon warehouse workers towards the beginning of the pandemic organized to demand better health protections, for example. Uh, but in many obvious ways, it also puts a damper on collective action because people under these circumstances may be more afraid to engage in organizing activity. Um, and of course, the economy uh, is is not doing very well. So that that also creates a, a greater greater sense of, of danger and risk. Um, there are many other things that that I could go into, um, but I will pause there and uh, and maybe we'll we'll have some questions. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Ben. Ha sido apasionante. Nos nos ha gustado muchísimo, pero lo que nos ha hecho ha sido plantearnos más dudas, que eso siempre bueno, pues, enriquece. Yo la primera pregunta que tengo eh, tiene que ver con nuestro propio contexto, en el sentido de qué podemos aprender eh, desde aquí, de la, os, la organización de los movimientos de workers en, en los Estados Unidos. ¿Cómo podemos aprender? ¿Qué, ¿Qué ejemplos podemos seguir? ¿Qué enseñanzas podemos 
compartir y tal vez replicar. Thank you for the question. Um, my Spanish isn't quite good enough to get the full meaning of oh, it, so I wonder if you could. I maybe got a third of it. <laughs> oh, no, no I, I, I cannot do that in English if you prefer that. Sorry, uh, I thought the translator was uh, translating that thing. No so problem. I can repeat you. No, so the, the question was, um, it was about uh, how could we replicate uh, these movements in Spain? We, we, are, we are super keen, we are willing to learn from your experience, no, as that's the hometown of digital capitalism, right? Um, and I think we have much to learn from the ways the white collar workers and booker workers has, have managed to uh, entangle and build uh, solidarities and alliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that the, we could take this from, from two angles. The first would be to speak specifically to tech workers in the tech industry. And the second would be to zoom out and speak more broadly about what we've been calling the middle layers or people who belong to this uh, kind of intermediary level between, between labor and capital, let's say. To speak first to the, the tech angle specifically, you know, I, I was in um, Berlin last summer and met a number of people who work in tech there. And what I was struck by is just how, um, you know, regionally specific tech work is. And that's true in the United States as well. I mean, the tech industry is dominated by Silicon Valley, but there are smaller clusters of the industry in places like Massachusetts and Texas and elsewhere. And they tend to have their own specific histories and their own um, you know, specific areas of specialization. So attending to the details of how tech is configured in different places in different national contexts and different regional contexts is absolutely critical for this kind of organizing work. I mean, one of the things that came up in conversations with German based organizers is this feeling that the Californian ideology uh, which I had mentioned, which is, you know, to speak very briefly, broadly, a kind of liberal libertarian worldview of hippie Reaganism. You should read the original essay. That's not a, not a perfect summary, but broadly, that's what we could call it, that this ideology in their view retained much more of its power among the rank and file of German tech workers than it did in a U.S. context. That, that in a U.S. context, by contrast, I think a number of forces over the years have been eroding the hegemony of that worldview, which in turn made it possible for these other alternatives, this kind of class-based approach to come into the conversation. So that's a long way of saying that I would hesitate to give you lessons or, or presume that I could speak to your experience because the particulars of what tech work looks like in different contexts is really critical for thinking about how to organize on that terrain. But I will speak very briefly to the question more broadly of how do we think about these layers between labor and capital? And this is a conversation that is an ongoing one within the US left, usually, um, revolves around what we sometimes call the professional managerial class, which is a formulation developed uh, by Barbara and John Ehrenreich, which is somewhat different way of theorizing what Eric Olin Wright was con calling the contradictory class locations, but is trying to understand the same phenomenon, which is how do you think about these people who aren't obviously proletarian or obviously bourgeois? And I think, you know, at least here we could find a lesson, which is a, let's say a, a somewhat broad one. So it needs to be applied to specific contexts. But the broad lesson is that organizers can do a lot at these layers, that there, these are actually fairly fertile ground for organizing. But the trick is to develop forms of organization that bring prominence to the proletarian elements and suppress the bourgeois elements. That sounds kind of clinical <laughs> and that what that looks like in practice varies. But I think hopefully the story that I've told is at least one case study in what that might look like. How do you take people whose lives are actually 
proletarian and bourgeois in different contradictory ways and develop forms of organization that allow them to focus on the proletarian elements to the exclusion of the bourgeois elements. So I, I think that that was also not particularly useful, but, but hopefully that gives us a little bit more to, to chew on in different contexts. Yes, yeah, Sardat, um, thank you very much for your, for your answer. I have another question. Um, we've been closely following the ongoing struggle with regards to the legislation in California, the gig workers legislation. And I was wondering your thoughts on the limits on the liberal debates on how do we can regulate that or not. And we have seen that after all, after uh, winning the progressive, the so-called progressive legislation has been defeated by the digital capitalists. So what have you learned? What, what, what the people is discussing about that right now? I, I think mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Yeah, great question. And maybe just to give a very, very brief background for folks on, on what these, these, the story is. Um, California had recently passed a, a law, AB5, which essentially uh, made it harder for gig companies in particular, like Uber, Lyft, and others, to classify their workers as so-called independent contractors. This is a, a misclassification, an abuse of US labor law that has allowed these companies to get away with not paying a minimum wage, not providing basic benefits, and so on. In response to this law, uh, the gig companies uh, put together a ballot proposition, uh, Proposition 22, which passed in November in California. And what this proposition does is it exempts app-based drivers from this law. So if you're a Uber or a Lyft driver or, or a gig worker, a DoorDash delivery worker, um, you are not subject to this more stringent definition of what an independent contractor is. So what that means is that these companies can continue to do business as usual to continue not to pay minimum wage, to continue to not provide basic benefits and, and so on. And since that victory, they have started to uh, develop similar strategies in other states. And the thought is that eventually this will become the subject of national legislation where they want to um, firmly define their workers as independent contractors who are not subject to certain protections um, under labor law. They want to do that not just in California, but they want to do it all over the country. And as many observers have pointed out, this is really the basis of their business model. You know, Uber uh, recently shut down its self-driving car unit. Uh, I think as many people had known for years, that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. It was always a wildly overhyped technology. But what that means is if they're ever going to reach uh, the, their market valuation or even a fraction of it, you know, this is a very unprofitable company. It's Uber, you know, hemorrhages money each year. And really the only path to something approaching sustainability is greater hyper exploitation of its workers. And they have to develop a legal framework that will enable them to do so. Um, so that's, I think, the fairly depressing context in which to understand what's happening. Of course, there has been, as I alluded to earlier, a wave of really inspiring militancy among gig workers um, against these, these companies um, and who were united in the fight against Prop 22. Um, groups like uh, Rideshare Drivers United, uh, the Gig Workers Collective, and, and so on. And I think the hope more broadly is not only to challenge these types of laws um, and push back, kind of wage these defensive struggles, let's say, but also to imagine new forms of organizing and owning these services along more cooperative lines. And I'm sure many of the attendees of this conference are familiar with many of these experiments, but I think that's the further horizon uh, beyond, um, you know, beyond just surviving, which is, certainly more the emphasis these days for obvious reasons. Thank you very much. I have a final question. It's quite open. Um, it is year five after the socialist revolution. And 
What do you see? What happened with the internet? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, hopefully we just uh, shut it down. I think after five years of socialism, we may not need the internet anymore. Certainly like to spend less time on the internet. Hopefully we can manage that under socialism. But I, look, it's a great question. And I think a really essential one for us to ask. So much of the mainstream conversation here in the United States, and I suspect in Europe as well, has been, has taken a kind of liberal and technocratic form, which is how do we uh, create better privacy legislation to protect our data? How do we pursue antitrust solutions to create more competitive markets in services like search or e-commerce, or in some cases, maybe break up some of the tech giants? In other words, all of the reform proposals that have been circulating in the mainstream have sought to preserve the, the basic structure of the internet as it currently exists, which is as a privatized, marketized, commodified entity. And I think if we're gonna really address some of these deeper issues that we're, we're seeing you know, across the, the, everything we call the internet, which is a very big and kind of unwieldy category, um, we're gonna have to come up with new ways of organizing and owning this infrastructure, that it's not enough simply to write new rules about what Facebook can and can't do. It has a quality of whack-a-mole, if you're familiar with that game. You know, you, you hit one mole and another one pops up in a different place. You know, there's something, kind of exhausting about trying to legislate our way out of these endless, endless dangers. So the, a kind of more fundamental restructuring is required. And I, you know, I think there's a lot we can do short of a socialist revolution. I think we can think of a lot of the experience, experiments in publicly and cooperatively owned networks and what we might call platforms, although I don't love the word. Um, as prefigurative of the kind of internet that we would like to see and as spaces where we can begin to develop new, more cooperative forms of online life that if given proper support and if supplemented through political struggle, which will always be necessary, could come to displace the commodified forms that we know today. So hopefully that's not too... Um, pie in the sky and, and, and strikes the right balance between optimism and pessimism, which is always difficult. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. It's been amazing. Um, hopefully we'll keep talking with you, um, planning, plotting, conspiring, maybe. Um, thank you, you all. Thank you to the listeners. Uh, muchas gracias. Um, en 10 minutos comenzaremos con la siguiente charla. Tendremos con, con nosotras Aaron Menanap. Y nada, pues eso, os vemos en 10 minutos. And again, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, see thank you. Soon. Thank you. Bye.